Welcome to Bicom's Huddyun Weekly Podcast. My name is James Serene, Bicom CEO. I'm delighted to have with us today uh, Dr. Daphne Richmond Barak, who's the Assistant Professor at the IDC in Herzliya, Senior Researcher at the International Institute for Counterterrorism. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so, uh, really, we the main story um, for this week, um, which has been all over the news yesterday and into today, is about the uh, Israeli Operation Defensive Shield um, to uh, destroy what have been revealed as Hezbollah tunnels uh, built into and under Israeli territory. Um, the implication being that these would have been uh, routes by which Hezbollah fighters would have travelled into Israel to attack local communities and uh, potentially even take territory in northern Israel. Um, this is something that Israel has seen before. Uh, been an extensive problem for some years with Hamas building tunnels as well. Um, and uh, we, we've been looking at footage uh, from the IDF of some of the technology they've been using to destroy and detect these tunnels. Um, and this is part of a, a broader problem with how to secure the Israel-Lebanese border. So so, so um, I wanted to really ask you, um, how do you see this in terms of Hezbollah's um, wider strategy of trying to attack Israel in the future? So, so this is a remarkable development. Uh, first of all, what, what, we, what we heard about yesterday, Israel's uh, public admission for the first time that they are cross-border tunnels dug by Hezbollah at its uh, Lebanese border. Uh, the reason why it's remarkable is because these tunnels have been suspected for uh, quite a long time. Um, in fact, since 2006, during the Second Lebanon War, Israel already knew that Hezbollah liked uh, using this tactic of war, which is quite an old tactic of war, in fact, because um, they found tunnels inside Lebanese territory. But until now, the tunnels uh, located at the border were just a mere speculation and there was really no confirmation of their existence. So yesterday was truly a, a remarkable day in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of, of admitting uh, that this threat, which was suspected for a long time, actually exists. Um, of course, the tunnels, the Israeli tunnels, uh, we, they're not Israeli tunnels, but they, they threaten Israel. Uh, most of the time that they come up into the conversation is in connection to Hamas, and the Gaza border. Hamas also digs tunnels uh, from Gaza into Egypt, uh, but the ones that are that Hamas digs into Israel are very different, actually, from the ones that we that we talked about yesterday in the context of Hezbollah. There, there seems to be um, a difference also in terms of scale. Uh, some of the the actual size seem to be different. Were they more sophisticated? I mean, Hezbollah arguably has far greater resources at its disposal. So the, the tunnels that are that are dug by Hezbollah are not necessarily more sophisticated. Um, the the main difference um, is that the geological environment in which these tunnels are dug is very different from the one at the Gaza arena. They are dug in stone, and so this may require different techniques on the part of Hezbollah as to how to dig the tunnels. But perhaps most importantly, it requires it requires on the part of Israel to develop entirely new tools and new technology that would work specifically in that uh, geological environment, in, in you know detecting, uh, using sensors that are going to actually work uh, in stone. And that's, that's very different. Uh, the other thing that we noticed yesterday in terms of the tunnels is that they are similar in that they are not dug uh, beyond the 20 meter. They dug 25 meters into the ground. It's not much different from what we have in Gaza, um, but they are not fortified with cement. It seems that they, are, they don't have this kind of cement envelope that we see in the Gaza tunnels, uh, pre precisely because they are dug in stone and there, there is no need to fortify them in that respect. Uh, but in terms of their size and their depth and their, um, the fact that they have uh, electricity, for example, these are these are features that are that are similar in both in both cases. Mm. And in terms of the intent, I mean, it, ha had these tunnels sort of been completed and ready for operation, what what do you think would have been um, Hamas's operational desire to use them? How, how would they have been utilized? So here's the thing with tunnels: uh, you never really know what the intention is until they are used, and when they are actually used, it's too late. So this is why there's a huge um, um, 
maybe it could be surprising to someone, I guess, who's not familiar with this tactic, but there is an element of speculation as to what a tunnel might be used for. And you make this inference based on the entity that dug the tunnel. So you know Hezbollah. Uh, Israel knows very much how Hezbollah operates. Um, of course, Israel knows how the tactic of uh, uh, tunnel warfare has diffused, you know, from Gaza to Syria, by the way, to the rebels, to ISIS, and to Iraq. And then it seems that some of the ideas that uh, were perhaps practiced in a Syrian and Iraq uh, uh, theater might not make their way back into Israel via Lebanon. And they, what this means is that in terms of how they will be used, there's no doubt that there is a hostile intent beyond uh, the digging of these tunnels. So that makes no doubt. Now, will they be used to kidnap civilians, to kidnap uh, uh, soldiers? Will they be used to launch a major infiltration, uh, more like what North Korea, for example, has contemplated with its tunnels? Um, so you don't really know that. But one thing we might uh, see um, coming up is, again, something that comes uh, that would, could be imported from the Syrian uh, war, which would be the use of tunnel mining, uh, which is actually a tactic that dates back from World War I, but was very popular during the Syrian war and very efficient. So that could be something that we witness um, uh, going forward, but the more traditional, I guess, uses would be infiltration, uh, uh, surprising the enemy, uh, and kidnapping soldiers and civilians, and potentially also attacking civilians directly. Mm, that's very interesting. And in terms of your understanding of where Hezbollah is vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Israel, um, you know, there's some discussion, isn't there, about what Hezbollah is really trying to do. It's been tied down in the Syrian civil war with many fighters for a very long time. Um, and uh, there's been relative quiet on the Israel-Lebanon border for since really 2006, although we know that there's been a lot of reports of Hezbollah operatives who've been intelligence gathering and um, carrying out various activities right on the border. Um, but in terms of actual uh, fighting or exchange of fire, there's been almost nothing since that Lebanon war in 2006. So where do you think operationally Hezbollah are vis-a-vis -vis Israel? You're absolutely right. There has been a relative quiet, and I think this quiet could be, um, you know, can, can mean two things. First of all, Hezbollah was very busy with the Syrian war. Uh, they were a very important kind of like an uh, actor um, in, in that war, and they were actually deployed there. Um, so with the, so that could explain why they, they haven't been very much uh, involved, at least uh, actively uh, or visibly with Israel, but uh, in a kind of like less visible, and that is actually a pun that is that's quite interesting talking about tunnels, but in a less visible uh, aspect of, of this, there's no doubt that Hezbollah has also used this quiet in order to prepare, in order to to uh, to to uh, to strengthen itself and to, to get ready and to think about what comes next. So it's kind of um, it's a kind of a delicate situation, and I think the timing of this operation now that Israel is launching, which is set to apparently last a couple of weeks, which is so that is obviously something that's been planned for a long time. It could be that it's also related to the fact that with the Syrian war winding down, um, Israel anticipate these Hezbollah operatives to be more present in a, in a Israeli at the Israeli Lebanese border and more potentially uh, ready for uh, actually carrying out some actions whereas until now uh, their efforts were directed at the at you know making uh, Bashar Assad uh, prevail Mm. Well, there's a lot of debate, isn't there, about, uh, and I've heard this from a few Israeli analysts, that with the, um, you know, I suppose, quietening down of the, the Syrian civil war, that Hezbollah fighters, as you say, will return, but also that Iran's role um, and where it puts its resources will change, and that they have perhaps, this is the Iranians, have experienced that Syria is not the theatre that gave them as much freedom as they thought in terms of maybe building up what's been reported as missile factories to build up a missile capability in Syria against Israel, that maybe they will start to put many more resources into Lebanon. And there are reports of um, this uh, precision project where they're going to uh, be building more precision guided missiles actually in Lebanon um, in cooperation with Hezbollah. I just wondered what you thought about those reports and, and whether that they're substantiated. Last night, in uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's address, 
there seems to there seem to be allusions to to precisely this aspect that you're bringing up that perhaps it's more than just the tunnels. I mean, just the tunnels. I'm putting that in. You know, uh, obviously it's it's an, it's not a very serious uh, uh, characterization, but it's it, obviously the tunnels are a very big threat. But perhaps there's more even that that the, the Israeli uh, army and the Israeli government are not yet sharing with either its public or with the world at large, and that perhaps. Um, these actions that have to do with Lebanon, they are also directed at limiting Iran's influence in Lebanon. And potentially, if they have missile factories, uh, which they probably do, then this might be stage two or this might be part of what Israel is contemplating in case there is an escalation, which I don't believe Israel wants. But that's definitely hanging in there in the background. I think you're absolutely right on that. So there are the tunnels, but there are also other things that we don't know yet. Um, but I think in terms of timing, we do have the foreign the, the Hezbollah fighters returning. Um, we do have, uh, and another thing we, that we have is that Israel clearly waited for these cross-border tunnels, these Hezbollah tunnels coming from Lebanon to actually cross the Israeli border. And I think that's important because Israel obviously wants to do this with as much backing uh, of uh, its allies and the international community as possible. Uh, it doesn't mean that it absolutely needs this backing, but it probably um, would like to have it. And I think having waited for these tunnels to cross the border to show the world what it's like to have these cross-border tunnels, and they are definitely more than one or two, uh, they, they have made that clear. Um, so that creates a, le a legitimacy for Israel to go and protect its territorial integrity, its sovereignty, to protect its citizens, and I and I believe that Israel is building on that and 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 went for this timing in order um, to to uh, to get to to have this legitimacy and to gain this support to the extent that it that it can be uh, obtained. Well, because I mean, you know, you're, you're you're a lawyer by background, and 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 I guess you can comment on this that 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 really it's a very straightforward violation of international law, isn't it? I mean, you're 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 building an illegal incursion into the sovereign territory of another country that Israel and Lebanon are separated by by the blue line, which is demarcated by the United Nations at the end of the Lebanon War. So it's not the kind of situation like you have in Gaza, where it's a kind of ceasefire line, and it's you know, in terms of international law, it's a much more complex situation but but in terms of the israel lebanon border it's actually very straightforward or at least should be it's a blue line uh, a border demarcated by by um by the un although it's not an agreed international border between israel and lebanon per se as a result of a kind of peace treaty but it's still pretty clear cut so if you've got hezbollah building a tunnel into israeli territory then and that is a very straightforward a very severe violation is it not uh, absolutely. So this is a violation of Israel's uh, sovereignty. This is a violation of uh, Israel's uh, territorial integrity. Um, any state who would find cross-border tunnels at this border would feel threatened, particularly if it has, and I think this is quite important, a, a history of uh, of um, an unfriendly history, I would, I would put it, with that particular actor. So clearly Israel has been confronting Hezbollah, not just at the border, but really in many different contexts. Uh, and so uh, the, host the, the hostile intent leaves no doubt. So I think there's a couple of things that make for um, uh, Israel's right uh, under international law to, 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 to do something about these tunnels. So not only that they've actually crossed the border, but also that we're not talking about a friendly actor. Um, uh, we're talking about a very sensitive uh, border between Israel and Lebanon that is also supposed to be monitored and protected by UNIFIL, the UN forces, uh, who obviously have missed out completely on this tunnel enterprise. Um, so this is a sensitive area. This is a hostile actor. We're talking about m tunnels that have crossed the border. We're talking about many tunnels. The, uh, you know, Israel said that they will be destroying these tunnels along the border uh, and we will see in the coming days where exactly that is. But there is definitely more than one or two tunnels. And that matters in terms of strengthening Israel's legal justification to act. And now the next big, big question is whether Israel will be able uh, um, to destroy these tunnels or to eliminate the threat that it's facing by solely acting on its own territory meaning that the 40 meters of the tunnels that reach into Israeli territory, if we destroy that, if Israel destroys that, would that be sufficient to eliminate the threat? And the answer to that is absolutely not. 
There is no doubt that Israel will have to enter Lebanese territory to deal with this like any other state would because this is the nature of the threat, which is very, very pervasive. And if you destroy only the 40 meters that are on your own soil, you just run the risk that Hezbollah will continue digging the tunnel somewhere else, uh, just using a different route. So they might be delayed, but they will not be actually uh, completely stopped from uh, carrying out whatever tunnel operation they want to carry out. So I think all these elements uh, matter in order, you know, when it comes to assessing Israel's legal uh, uh, right to react and what it can do. It, I don't believe that a full-fledged war would be justified, but a precise signature, um, you know, uh, limited uh, uh, actions and anti-tunnel operations against these tunnels only on Lebanese territory, I believe, would be uh, would be um, and and given the nature of the threat, particularly uh, and all the elements that I've m- mentioned, that would be uh, that would give Israel the the, the legal um, backup. Legal backup, yeah. I mean, the other, I mean, my final question would be just what what this now means for Unifil and also for 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 the Lebanese armed forces and the Lebanese um, government, because I mean, clearly, um, you know, there've been lots of debates about Unifil and requests for Unifil to sort of raise its game in trying to deal with. Hezbollah activity on the border and and clearly like you said they've missed this major activity that's been going on in that area and secondly the Lebanese armed forces are supposed to be the only um, sort of legal entity that should be um, uh, patrolling the border uh, and clearly they're also not enforcing um, uh, that authority if if, if uh, Hezbollah is able to do what it's been able to do so very big questions there for UNIFIL and for the Lebanese armed forces. Uh, absolutely UNIFIL um you know, yesterday the, the prime minister showed, um, um, there was a press conference and he showed where is the uh, tunnel, the route of the tunnel located uh, and how far it is from the Unifil uh, um, uh, post. And it is very, very close. And there have been trucks moving the earth around, the earth that has been excavated in order to allow for the digging of the tunnel. And all of this has been going on under the eyes of Unifil. It's not the first time that there is a level of disappointment, at least among the Israeli public, as to the role that UNIFIL is, is supposed to, 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 to fill and what it actually is doing. So, yes, it cannot actually stop Hezbollah. I don't believe that's in its mandate, but it can raise flags and it can, um, it can uh, you know, call on the parties to, to, to act. It cannot maybe not do it itself, but it, there are uh, means at its disposal to, to kind of uh, deal with the situation. And, and, it, and so this is a breach of the, of the resolution of the Security Council 1701 the digging of these cross-border tunnels by Hezbollah. This is a breach of international law, and really international is not, um, you know, will not, uh, cannot be interpreted to say that a state that is the victim of a cross-border aggression of this kind um, has to stand idle, either waiting for the tunnels to be used or, or I don't know what else. So, there has to be some level of, of pragmatism, I guess, in, in how we interpret international law and what kind of tools we give to states to defend themselves against these kind of actors. And we have to know what to expect from, uh, you know, international forces like UNIFIL that are, uh, we have to constantly, states have to be constantly um, on the lookout for and for their interest because uh, this story shows that, uh, unfortunately, these methods are, are good, but only for a time. Mm. Absolutely. Um, I think we've run out of time there, but thank you so much for that. We've covered we've covered a lot of ground, and your analysis is, will really add to our understanding of this uh, developing and, and quite complex story. So, uh, Daphne Richmond Barak, thank you so much for joining thank us you, and being Eddie, on our podcast. I just may add that if you want more context on this, I, I published a book with Oxford University Press on underground warfare, where I really cover this in even more depth. 